Over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about scrotal emergencies. Now, these patients present with the acute scrotum, which is defined as acute painful swelling of the scrotum, typically with either local or generalized symptoms. And they account for about only 0.5% of emergency department visits. However, they're critical to recognize as many of the conditions, if not treated appropriately, can be associated with infertility, testicular atrophy, sepsis, abscess formation. So we'll start off by talking a little bit about anatomy. Now, uh, the scrotal sac itself is this brown layer over here, and uh, this is composed of multiple individual layers, the superficial most of which is the skin surface itself. Now, just deep to this, you have the tunica vaginalis. This is a two-layered serous membrane. One layer that surrounds the scrotal sac is called the uh, parietal layer, and the other layer that surrounds portions of the epididymis and testicle is the uh, visceral layer. In between, there's a potential space in which fluid collections or hydrocele can develop or hematocele if there's blood collections in that location. And this is an important structure because uh, if it completely encircles the testicle and epididymis, as can be seen in what is called the bell clapper deformity, can make these patients more prone to testicular torsion. Now, deep to the tunica vaginalis, you have the tunica albuginea. Now, this is a thin fibrous layer that uh, surrounds the scrotum, and from this, there are individual septations that divide the scrotum into multiple compartments. It actually divides them to anywhere from 250 to 400 compartments. Now, within each of these compartments, you have one to three seminiferous tubules, these kind of coil-like structures over here. And they, in turn, uh, drain at the area of the mediastinal testes to, through um, a structure called the ready testes. They give rise to the efferent ductules, which are these little structures over here. And these converge in the epididymis, which is this kind of snake-like structure over here. The epididymis is composed of the epididymal head, body, and tail. And you can see in the region of the head, this is anywhere from 5 to 10 millimeters in size. And as you go a little bit uh, towards the body and tail, it thins out and it's anywhere from 2 to 4 millimeters in size. Now the epididymis eventually drains into the vas deferens, which is this kind of tubular structure over here. And that eventually goes and joins in the spermatic cord up here, which also contains uh, multiple additional structures, including lymphatics, the pimpiniform flexus, this blue stuff over here. These are the venous uh, plexus of the uh, testicle, and uh, this is what gets dilated with varicoceles, and also contains multiple arteries that supply the testicle. And the testicle itself, in terms of size in postpubertal males, is typically about 5 by 3 by 2 centimeters in size. Now, arterial supply to the testicle is via a bunch of vessels, predominantly the testicular arteries that arise off the aorta, just distal to the renal arteries. These travel in the spermatic cord. They go inside the tunica albuginea as the capsular arteries, and they radiate it inwards as the centripetal arteries. There's additional blood supply from the cremisteric arteries that arise from the inferior epigastric artery, as well as the deferential artery, which arises off the superior vesicular artery from the internal iliac vessels. Waveforms within the testicle are low resistance, so will have good flow throughout systole and diastole, with studies showing a mean resistive index to 0.6. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is epididymitis and epididymal orchitis. Epididymitis itself is the most common cause of scrotal pain. It typically happens in young adults aged 18 to 35 years of age. People present uh, with pain, uh, fever. Now it's important to know that this is often a retrograde infection. And because it's retrograde, the epididymal tail will get inflamed before the body and head. So if you really want to look for epididymitis, you got to look towards the epididymal tail, which is sort of this area over here. Now, the bugs that cause this in men are below the age of 35 and are sexually active is usually sexually transmitted infection. So in that subset of group, Neisseria and Chlamydia are uh, common culprits. And older patients, typically above the age of 35 or not sexually active, E. coli is commonly seen. Now, concomitant inflammation involvement of the testicle, which is epididymal architis, can be seen in 40 to 80 percent, but this can be focal and this can be diffuse. And on imaging findings, we're basically going to see both the epididymis and the testicle that are going to be enlarged, very heterogeneous in appearance, and lots of flow on color Doppler imaging. It'll be very hyperemic, and the patients clinically will be very tender on examination. Now, the treatment for this is uh, antibiotics, so prompt treatment with antibiotics is essential. If not treated, uh, patients can go on to form abscess formation in the epididymis or potentially in the testicle. Uh, the testicle itself can undergo ischemia and atrophy, uh, resulting in uh, infertility. Now, another uh, scrotal emergency that's an absolute do not miss is testicular torsion. 
Now, patients with torsion can present clinically similar to epididymitis with acute onset of pain. Some of them may have nausea, vomiting, or low-grade fever. However, the key imaging difference will be that there is absence of flow. And you want to maximize your settings for slow flow. Definitely verify the lack of color flow with spectral Doppler and power Doppler. But if you have a lack of flow in a testicle that has a lot of pain, that is diagnostic of testicular torsion. Now, one of the big risk factors for testicular torsion is having the bell clapper deformity, something that I've alluded to earlier on. Now, that instance, the tunica vaginalis completely encircles the testicle and the epididymis. So if I were to kind of just redraw this a little bit next to it, it's actually going to come outside, uh, obviously confined still by the scrotal skin, and completely encircle the epididymis, all of the testicle, and go upstairs all the way to the spermatic cord. As a result, the testicle itself is relatively free to rotate inside the tunica, and as a result can make it prone to twisting and torsion. Now the bell clapper deformity is seen in up to 12% of patients who have testicular torsion, and it's actually bilateral in up to 80% of patients. And what that means from a clinical perspective is patients who have testicular torsion, you know, they need to be detoured either manually in the emergency room setting or in the OR, but they'll also need orchiopexy, and oftentimes it's bilateral orchiopexy because the incidence of this deformity is up to 80% in both testicles. Now one of the important things to remember on imaging is that grayscale imaging and testicular torsion may be negative very early on the disease, particularly at about four hours from the onset of symptoms. Typically, at, after six hours, you're going to start to see some heterogeneity, and the increased heterogeneity that you see on grayscale imaging is associated with decreased testicular viability. And ideally, patients would be um, tr recognized and treated within six hours between the onset of symptoms to maintain a viability. If you can do that within six hours, the viability is anywhere from 90 to 100 percent. Conversely, if you wait after 12 hours, the viability drops to about 20 percent. So time is of the essence in testicular torsion. Another imaging finding that can be seen with testicular torsion is the presence of the whirlpool sign. And what this is, is simply imaging the spermatic cord, which appears twisted on imaging. So you'll see a lobulated mass with areas of increased and decreased echogenicity corresponding to vessels and fat and other contents of the spermatic cord. The vessels in this location may be spiraled in their appearance. There may be no flow within the spermatic cord because it's twisted. There may be an abrupt cutoff of flow. But oftentimes with these patients with testicular torsion, they're having pain. If you look at the spermatic cord, you may be able to see this whirlpool sign. And lastly, there's something called torsion detorsion. So I'm just going to abbreviate that T and D for torsion detorsion. Now, in this instance, you have a testicle that is twisted and torsed that spontaneously detorses. As a result, the patient no longer has the pain. And on imaging, you don't see a lack of flow in the testicle, but instead you start to see hyperemia. So if you were to just look at the imaging itself, the hyperemia would be suggestive of orchitis. However, patients with orchitis have testicular pain, whereas these patients don't have any testicular pain. The other thing to note about orchitis, if we go back upstairs to this first point, isolated orchitis is really uncommon. Who gets isolated orchitis? It's patients who have mumps, and oftentimes in that setting, it's seen bilateral. So oftentimes, if you have orchitis, you're going to see an epididymal abnormality, or in these patients, you're going to see hyperemia of the testicle, no necessary epididymal issues, and no pain. Now, another really important do not miss diagnosis that can be quite life-threatening is Fournier's gangrene. Now, this is a really aggressive and necrotizing soft tissue infection. It's polymicrobial, and it happens in patients who have some risk factors, you know, suppression or impaired circulation, things like diabetes, HIV, uh, patients with uh, liver or renal failure. Mortality rates can be quite high, up to 50%, so it's critical to be able to recognize it. And the treatment for this is antibiotics and surgical debridement. And the key finding with Fournier's gangrene, whether it's on the ultrasound or CT imaging, is the presence of gas in the scrotal skin. Now, that's much easier sometimes to see on CT imaging, but oftentimes patients will, will present with acute scrotal pain, and you're looking for potentially uh, epididymitis or torsion, but instead, the patient will have Fournier's gangrene. So you need to know what that looks like. And gas within the scrotal skin will manifest as foci, round or linear foci of increased echogenicity with very dirty shadowing. So it's not the clean shadowing you see associated with uh, stones in this location, but rather dirty shadowing posterior to it and in the appropriate setting that's got to make you get worried for Fournier's gangrene, which is a urologic emergency.
Another thing that uh, is not quite as emergent but can cause acute scrotal pain is thrombosed varicocele. So I'm just going to actually write it up right over here. Now varicoceles themselves are uh, quite common. They represent abnormal dilatation of the pimpiniform plexus, so these vessels uh, you can see over here in the spermatic cord. And they occur about 50% of adult males. They're more common on the left side. They are uh, set to feel like a bag of worms if they're palpable. And some percentage of varicoceles, particularly ones that are palpable, have been associated with infertility. Now thrombosis of varicocele, on the other hand, is uh, or spontaneous thrombosis is quite uncommon. They can present with discrete scrotal pain. You can may sometimes maybe feel a mass. And on imaging, you're just going to see these tubular structures without any flow. By definition, a varicocele will be anything more than two millimeters in size. So you'll see something that's two to three millimeters in size, maybe up to four millimeters with low level echoes inside of it and no flow. When you see that outside of the testicle, you got to think of a thrombosed varicocele. Now, another absolutely critical thing to be able to recognize is the presence of scrotal trauma. And it's not only trauma, but it's which of those patients with scrotal trauma need to go to the OR. Now, patients with scrotal trauma can have a variety of types of injuries. The one that you need to be able to recognize no matter what is testicular rupture. Now rupture of the testicle, the imaging finding is the tunica albuginea, so this layer over here, there is a discontinuity in it. Now this can be associated with fractures of the testicle, hematomas, content of the testicle can extrude outside of the tunica albuginea into the scrotal sac, but discontinuity of the tunica albuginea is the key finding for testicular rupture. Patients with testicular rupture need to go to the operating room for repair. Now, testicular fracture, on the other hand, if it's just an isolated fracture, these don't always need to go to the OR. If they're associated with rupture, they'll need to go to the OR. And for that, you're going to see an avascular kind of hypoechoic uh, line that's kind of coursing through the testicle itself. So you'll see a line like that in the setting of scrotal trauma. You're going to be worried about a testicular fracture. Hematomas and hematoceles may also be seen in the setting of trauma. And the important thing to know about at least hematomas, over time they'll become more cystic or anechoic in appearance. And if they're large, typically greater than five centimeters, they're ex and they're expanding, you know, these patients may also undergo surgical exploration because it's difficult in that setting to rule out a tunica albuginea uh, discontinuity, i.e a testicular rupture, and that enlargement can cause pressure necrosis and atrophy of the testicle if the hematoma is not evacuated. Segmental testicular infarcts are another cause of acute scrotal pain, and the reason that uh, these are important to recognize is because if they're appropriately recognized, these patients don't need to go to the operating room. Also, these patients will present with acute scrotal pain. It's really uncommon though. You're not going to see this, um, you know, some studies show anywhere from 0.3% to maybe 3.5% of all patients who come to the ER with any scrotal issues will have a segmental testicular infarct. Most cases are idiopathic. There's some reported uh, risk factors or predisposing conditions, particularly sickle cell disease, polycythemia, vera, some, issue, some cases of trauma, some cases of acute uh, epididymitis, orchitis can be associated with segmental testicular infarcts. And the key finding here is you typically will see a very geographic, often wedge-shaped region of heterogeneity within the testicular parenchyma with its vertex pointing towards the mediastinal testes. Inside of it, there'll be no flow on color imaging. Now, if you see that, you're going to be worried about a segmental infarct, particularly if somebody comes in with testicular pain. But it's possible that these patients may harbor a very hypovascular testicular neoplasm that's just not showing a lot of uptake on um, color imaging. So in those instances, it's prudent to either follow this up with imaging to make sure that this gets better over time or resolves, or an MR imaging is sometimes used. And on MR imaging, and sometimes in ultrasound as well, you'll see a very distinct perilesional rim of enhancement surrounding this area with the lesion itself being completely avascular in appearance.